Hello, Ian. It's good to see you again. Yeah. Hello, Alex. We're back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let's continue this journey. Today's chapter eight, creativity, mm. nothing more, nothing less. Mm. All yeah. right. How should we begin? Well, uh, I, I'd like to just um, say a little bit about what I mean by creativity, um, because I do in part two of the book, which we'll be coming on to in a couple of weeks time, I do uh, talk quite a bit about the power of the imagination. But here I'm talking specifically about creativity, which is one of the ways in which we do bring the world into being. We are not entirely passive in relation to the world. We don't sit there naively kind of waiting for this world to impress itself on our photographic plate. We go to the world with expectations, with ideas, and we also are capable of altering the way in which we put things together in our mind. So part of the business of actually getting to understand <clears throat> the world at the level of a portal of information, creativity comes into play too. So I, I'm, I'm sort of differentiating what we do in this chapter with uh, what we do later when we come on to imagination. But there's no hard and fast distinction. I mean, as so often in the human world, these distinctions are not black and white. The other thing I thought I would say, because it's not something we we often think about, is the nature of creativity in the animal world. It, it, there's not much creativity as we understand it in animals. Um, you know, they don't uh, compose music or draw paint or draw diagrams or, 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 or paint paintings. But the thing that I do feel is that there is something creative about their response to a new threatening situation. We know that species that are capable of coming up with new solutions to a problem that they could never have been programmed for, these are the ones that really survive. So there's an element in evolution which favors the creative. <clears throat> and for the time being, reaches its um, temporary uh, zenith with, with the human being, mm. in which there is uh, creativity on a wholly different level, I guess. So, yeah, that was what I wanted to start with. Um, and then perhaps we could sort of come on to talking about how to think about creativity at all and the brain correlates of those processes. Great. Could we briefly kind of agree on a working definition of creativity? Is it the ability to bring forth the new in the world? Is, it, is that too abstract? Like sometimes I get confused when, when we could say, well, creativity is the ability to invent, but then inventing something or even solving a problem, sometimes it can be done by rearranging existing elements into something that in a way it's new but it's not truly new you see what i mean you were mentioning animals a moment ago and and evolution like in a way evolution could be said to be creative right um y yes i think we, it can we shouldn't be too obsessed with definitions i th i don't think we usually are even when we've talked about <laughs> perception and attention i mean it's like we know what we're talking about but we're looking at it from different angles and then the gestalt kind of is there, but, but well, probably this will come up later when we talk about the studies that are performed to study creativity. We have to do something with inside, with problem solving, but what's your, your best attempt now to begin with, to give a, a definition of this word, and then we'll talk about how elusive it is as a phenomenon to study, but what would be a decent definition of what we're talking about? Yes, uh, you're quite right to make a distinction between creativity and mere problem solving, although creativity sometimes does come into finding a new uh, response to a certain kind of problematic set of circumstances. Mm. Um, one of the troubles that you've hinted at is that when people want to scan somebody and do a study on creativity, you can't put somebody in a scanner and say, well, be creative. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't happen like that. So what they tend to do is to ask them to solve problems or make new connections. And you're quite right in saying that <clears throat> this is not really an, an, um, an analogy of what we mean by the great creativity. It, it, pro all problem solving is interesting, but not all of it is 
um, highly creative. And I, I, you know, I make this kind of reference to filling in your tax information. You know, you have to solve some problems while you're doing your tax return. But on the whole, we don't call this creative unless we're um, actually uh, engaged in fraud. <laughs> so I think what it is, is the, the ability to to allow to come into being a new, a truly new gestalt. That's the nearest I can get. So problem solving doesn't involve a new gestalt. Um, making connections can mm. certainly involve a new gestalt, but it's in those cases where it does involve, um, a, uh, you know, it does produce um, a new gestalt that we talk about it being creative. So it's a very hard thing to describe, but it's it's slightly like um, many of the most important things in life that it's easy to recognize, but it's not so easy to circumscribe in 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 language. Yeah, that's a that's a great definition for me. Um, and I really appreciate the word allow there, because it may be that something mm -hmm. that one because I said some seconds ago, like the ability to bring forth as if, as if it's something that kind of by com we compel but as we'll see, right, it, uh, it's something that in a way we need to prepare the ground for, but it happens in a way to us. Yes. And that's rather yes, mysterious not, not... and fascinating at the same time. It is, it is. Mm -hmm. and, and everything about the process points to the fact that you can't make it happen on demand. Mm. You know, many people um, make a living going around talking to uh, management groups about how to be more creative, um, which is, uh, fair enough but it's it's really slightly beside the point point. people think that because of what i've studied i must be able to give them a few hot tips on how to be creative mm -hmm. um and up to a point i can certainly say things to avoid doing uh mm -hmm. but you can't just say if you do this something creative will follow it, it doesn't happen like that but even by saying uh, things not to do we're already pointing to the fact that we need to be painting ourselves out of the picture, not into the picture. The trouble is that we foreground our minds, our activity when we try to be creative. Mm. And when we try to be creative, creative, or even try not to try to be creative, because <laughs> we've discovered that's not right, <laughs> either of these situations involves too much conscious effort. And it's just exactly that that we need to get out of the picture. It's well known that people need to be relaxed. They need to have no time pressures if they're going to be creative. That does mean that sometimes they won't come up with anything. I admit that. But there isn't a way of avoiding that. If you try to fence the process around in such a way that it will always produce something that you call creative, it will never produce anything truly original or interesting. It will only produce marginal variations. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting and problematic area, if you like, but only problematic if you believe the world conforms to the way the left hemisphere says it works. Mm -hmm. If you know perfectly well that it doesn't, as I imagine that by now our listeners and certainly readers will know that um, it doesn't work that way, then it's, it's not so problematic. That's a great start, Ian. Uh, I think that kind of sets us really into talking about it. And I... I wasn't expecting to kind of grasp those things in, in the clear way you just put them. Um, yeah, so let's move on and talk about these kind of stages, if you, if you wish, that you articulate in the book before getting into the lesions and the hemispheres. Yes. Well, I do talk about the various um, requirements, if you like. Mm -hmm. In other words, the the things that must at least be present if there is to be creativity. Mm -hmm. And I think I talk about them under three headings. The one that I talk about least and will only mention in passing here is intrinsic personality and the character of one's cognition. So mm -hmm. there are individuals who are just well set up for this. They need to be able to combine things that are not in themselves uh, rare but in combination are relatively rare. So mm -hmm. there is a, a, a certain level of intelligence that must be uh, achieved. <clears throat> there needs to be the ability to draw together 
things that seem normally disparate uh, and the ability to make connections and see a new gestalt. So part of that is who you are. But it's it's the processes that, that uh, the other things that we need that I should talk about. Um, perhaps I, I would say something like there are three main requirements which have temporal phases and I'll deal with the temporal phases uh, second. But for now, what I would say is there needs to be a generative faculty that is the that allows something to come into being it is not crowding it out with already conceived ideas it's not attempting to clarify it too early to have the detail too early in the process um it's not saying i don't see how that works let's dismiss that or um this seems to be very ambivalent. I don't know which way it's going to go. There's two opposites here that need to be clarified. Which one? All those trying to clarify it too early is, is unhelpful. So what one needs is a mind that is capable of being still enough and receptive enough to allow something new to come into being, um, not crowding it out by attempts to make it happen or thoughts about why it's happening or why it's not happening and so on. Um, then I suppose there is what I would call the permissive uh, qualities, which are really part of getting out of the way of this process. Mm. You, you can't, um, it, it, I often use the image of, of gardening because it's very close to my heart. There is a garden here just outside my window. Um, and a gardener cannot make a plant for, for sure. A gardener can't even make a plant grow. The plant makes itself grow. But what the gardener does is either create the circumstances in which that plant can thrive or make um, fail to make it and, and uh, choke or stifle the plant so that it can't grow to the, the, the best of its uh, ability and capacity. So it's a bit like that. Um, most of the advice is don't do certain things. And that permissive element is, is very important. And those things, those are faculties that we need to have, the, the generative, the ability to, to make connections, to see new shapes, to um, avoid over verbalizing and letting the thing be and accepting it for a while until it, it declares itself more clearly. And the other is translational, which is the ability to carry this over. So you have initial insight. There are many examples of this in science where people had an insight one night walking home from the lab, suddenly sees something in the sky. This astronomer that's been looking at it for, 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 for a decade or so and suddenly sees an insight that what he's trying to uh, describe here has to do fundamentally with uh, with the helix with, with helices um so it's it's that's fine but it's then turning it into um a, a more explicit theory that can be tested and we know from many accounts and perhaps some of the most famous are uh, those of einstein and those of poincare french um, mathematician uh, where they describe in their lives how they they strove for these things and then suddenly when they were doing something else like playing the piano or going shopping the idea came and then it took them uh, weeks or months to be able to um, as we would say, retrace the steps by which they achieved it, but they never achieved it by those steps. Mm. They achieved it in a different way and are now describing the way in which someone else would be able to get there by using those steps. Mm. I perhaps ought to mention here, because I think it's intriguing, that a lot of research has been done on uh, mathematicians um, coming to certain conclusions, and even on children in school about how they approach mathematics. And what seems to be true is that the averagely gifted use an analytic sequence in order to try and solve the problem. Um, and they describe feeling gradually warmer as they go forward in these steps as getting closer and closer. Whereas the, the more in, in, intelligent and mathematically gifted um, students and adult mathematicians uh, describe a completely different process, which is not analytic, but is um, more um, 
gestalt-like. It's a more a process of opening up to a new pattern, to seeing a new pattern form that is very important. Um, and, and then they describe suddenly um, realizing um, w the answer to this, this question. I see. Uh, w what's quite interesting is they often feel, uh, those mathematicians often feel uh, a, a sense of warmth just a few seconds before they have the, the actual insight. Which speaks about embodiment in a, in a, in a rather puzzling way. Um, mm. Well, let, let me go back to a couple of things because I, 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 at least I would like to clarify them for me. Um, one is the relationship between creativity and intelligence. If you can say something mm -hmm. more about it, especially because we covered intelligence and, and in a way it's related, but we're not talking about the same thing, aren't we? Uh, not talking about the same? Uh, like the, the correlation between intelligence and creativity. Oh, you said the, 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 they're not the same, are they? Obviously, they're not the same. But there is but to, a, one, to what degree they're correlated? Um, they are correlated um, fairly strongly. Um, there is a minimum IQ level that one needs uh, for certain kinds of creativity. For the simplest kind, um, the bar that one has to cross is something like an IQ of eighty-five, which is um, far from being. Unusual. In fact, obviously the norm is 100, so you don't actually have to have great intelligence. But for other problems, you'd have to have at least an IQ of 120 to 130, which is the sort of average IQ of um, a graduate these days from university. Um, but it's also clear that with higher intelligences, 150, 160 or greater, there are greater, stronger correlations with creativity. So it is an element. And I suppose that we intuitively feel that we wouldn't, if we knew somebody was, you know, not very intelligent, we wouldn't imagine them as coming up with um, sparkling new insights, uh, where, <laughs> whereas when we know somebody is very bright, we expect that they probably will, and they do. So that that is a correlation. I do talk about it a little bit in that chapter. It's yes, true. Yes, a yeah. bit. And, and that sounds reasonable to me. At the same time, I can imagine some people, maybe most, not most, but many people, that's not popular again, because it's not just this idea that creativity is on demand, but it, this idea that it's on demand for everybody. Um, yes. Well, it doesn't sound as good news to say, well, it's not on demand and actually it's not the same degree for everybody. But no, it, it's ex extraordinary that we live in this world in which we simply have decided that everybody has the same chance of achieving everything. Well, they don't, you know. I mean, being born at the height I am, I could never have been a basketball player. I mean, it's just excluded for me. Why should that be true, but other things not be true? It's, it's, it's very obvious that we have faculties that we're born with, we can develop them, we can stunt them, and so on. And another unpopular idea is that a degree of hard work and application is also important for achievement. I, I know this is currently unpopular to say, but it's manifestly obvious. <laughs> and <clears throat> you, we know that from it, it, from personal experience that if you achieved any great project that it dem demands an enormous amount of um, application, self-discipline and so forth. The other yeah. cl clarification... But we're talking... Sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, but that, of course, that doesn't particularly apply to creativity, except in this last phase of translation. Mm. I give the example of, um, uh, gosh, is it Richard? Dyson, I think, um, who invented the um, Dyson uh, Bagless vacuum cleaner and uh, the, the the air blade, the thing in the in the public laboratories where you put your hands in and they, they dries them. Yeah. But he he saw a connection between a domestic task like uh, vacuum cleaning the floor and something he'd seen in oil refineries and sawmills and he made the connection 
And that was the highly creative thing that he's proved very good at doing. But actually turning that into a reality that he could market required, I think he says, something like 1,529 attempts before he actually achieved it. So he obviously had great power to stay with a goal and try and achieve yeah. it. Yeah. So if we, if we uh, think more about the phases, mm. I, I think that's very important, the phases of the creative process. It'll, it'll bring all this together in a way that I think might be helpful. And because of people not really making a distinction between um, these different phases, much of the discussion about what creativity is like uh, gets derailed. So it's important to be clear about them. Mm. I was just curious if, call... we, if, we, if we have one more minute to dwell on, on because I'm fascinated by these generative and permissive um, quality if you mm. have phases and qualities of mind and you could even say qualities of of the will because i mean it, it's it's strange for at least for me because uh, we're schooled um just to be either passive or active but this seems to have both qualities like both these opposites kind of transcend it in a way right like because you, you need to be generating something but at the same time getting out of the way could, could you say something Absolutely. more about it because it's I, th I, I feel it's important and it's not, I mean, I, I sense what we're talking about because perhaps I've experienced it, but it defies our normal modes of operating, right? Because either I'm doing it or I'm letting it do, but when I'm just getting out of the way, in a way, I, I would say I'm still there um, sustaining it or wel welcoming it, uh, you see? And so, so it's not yes. either or, black and white. No, it, absolutely. And that's a very good um, point to make. I, I sometimes um, used to use the phrase active passivity mm. uh, that is required, but I think actually that that's less helpful than the phrase I, I now tend to use, which is active receptivity. Mm. So what is required is, is something like, you know there's something here, you're straining your ear to hear it, and you're going out to meet it and you're keeping very quiet so that you can pick up what it is you don't know yet what it is um so you can't go oh i see what that is you you're going what is that but you have to stay with this process um for quite a long period and it, it's that openness to something that has not yet declared itself but has perhaps a bit of a shape you know i these days sadly i don't write poetry much but in the past i did to a certain extent and in writing a poem one feels the shape of a phrase or the shape of a line before actually the full phrase or the full line is there you can feel something happening that is something coming into being and you you mustn't interfere with it by trying to complete it yourself you must let it complete itself so being in a hurry being determined to make something happen is 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 uh, the opposite of what's required and this you know this is something that we talk about i talk about anyway <laughs> um in many circumstances and it comes again uh, will come again when we talk about our awareness of values, our awareness of purpose, our awareness of um, what one might call the sense of the sacred, that these things involve a kind of p preparation of attention in such a way that it can pick something up. It's not exactly passive, um, but it is, it is receptive. Mm, lovely. And, you, and it, it, it mustn't close it down too early. That's very important. It mustn't jump to conclusions. Don't forget the left hemisphere is the one that jumps to conclusions. The right hemisphere is the one that says, hang on, it may not be like that. We mm. need to leave that question open. But the left hemisphere needs closure all the time, as quickly yeah. as possible. It, and it's not to helpful. tolerate ambiguity, right, and, and imprecision is something where, again, we or I have at least been taught just to get rid of it as quickly as possible it's not it's it it, it may even feel uncomfortable um, but maybe that's yeah. just a bad habit like because uh, ambivalence which if we would split the world it, the word it, it's nice it's like things still can have different values it's like the virtual is still there don't force it to be actual right it, it's still there and just yes. learn, to, learn to even enjoy it like it's not necessarily doesn't need to be a struggle i suppose no no um, much better when you don't struggle too much. 
Or at least it will only <clears throat> resolve itself when you stop struggling. It won't happen while you are struggling. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes one does need to struggle, but I'll come on to that when I talk about the temporal phases of creativity. So there's a phase when that's appropriate and there's a phase when it's not appropriate. Um, yeah, yeah. So thinking about that, uh, I, I guess the first phase is what I would call preparation and again this is rather like the gardener preparing the soil um putting nutrients into the soil manure um watering and so forth so it's setting the ground for something that is going to happen in the future mm. but we don't know right now which plant or how it will grow we haven't mm. got that so <clears throat> That phase of preparation is when you equip your mind with enough information, you look at a whole raft of things that are relevant to this, you work at them. It's, it's, it's something that can be done consciously or unconsciously, but a lot of it is conscious. A lot of it is left hemisphere focused on a certain thing and looking at it in detail. And there's nothing wrong with this. And this process may last for weeks, months or years, and in some cases for decades. Some of the great discoveries were made only really after a decade of, of working away in a slightly everyday pedestrian way. But the thing is that the insight never came while doing that pedestrian everyday uh, work. <clears throat> but, but nonetheless, it's important as preparing the soil is important for a garden. <clears throat> then comes the phase of incubation. And this is when you do let it out of your conscious mind and you just allow it to you forget about it really and allow it to work away and it may sometimes say things in dreams but that's rather rare i mean there are instances in the history of science where people saw the answer to a problem in a dream it said that um mendeleev's um uh, mendeleev's tables uh, the the uh, tab tables of the uh, elements uh, came to him in a dream um, but it's not common mostly what it is is a matter of um, letting it be and not kind of constantly examining it um, any more than it's good for a plant for the gardener to keep digging it up to see how the roots are doing. That phase, I think, is much more clearly right hemisphere working on it. The preparation phase requires the, the cooperation of both hemispheres in a more or less conscious way. This phase of incubation is certainly taking place in the unconscious mind and most probably nourished by the right hemisphere i'll say why i, I, I say that in a minute <clears throat> and then comes the moment of illumination which is when as it were the flower blooms and it's that moment that a lot of people uh, think of as the creative process it's the end of the creative process um and that is uh, very strongly associated with the right hemisphere it's the so-called aha moment in which the solution comes out of apparently nowhere, but of course not from nowhere, but out of one's unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, enormously strongly correlated with um, right temporal lobe activity, right superior temporal sulcus and right amygdala. So why do I say that in the important parts of this process, uh, the second to the, the incubation and the illumination, which are what most people think about when we ask them, what is, a, what is it to engage in a creative act? <clears throat> it's those phases that they will generally be focusing on. And those phases depend on a number of things that we've touched on. Uh, they depend on having a broad view. Um, Heraclitus says that men who would understand must uh, know many things indeed. So they need to have explored a number of different regions of knowledge. And they need, it, within that, that chosen realm, they need to see as broadly as they can the canvas on which this painting is going to be uh, secondly, secondarily placed. We also need um, to be able to make connections between distant elements that are not normally connected because they're not in proximity. Um, which again, the right hemisphere is better at than the left. And this is actually imaged in the structure, the neuronal structure of the right hemisphere compared with the left. The right hemisphere has more um, 
long distance connected connections within its neuronal architecture, whereas in the left hemisphere, um, there are more tightly circumscribed local um, centers. Uh, so that, that, that actually images the difference in the way in which they attend to the world. So we need to be able to bring these things together. We need to be able to be perfectly comfortable with the idea of it being something quite new and different. Again, the left hemisphere approaches everything as ultimately familiar. It must belong in one of my boxes and my boxes are the things I know. Whereas the right hemisphere is able to say, <clears throat> You know, this is something new and, and this is very, very well researched um, uh, by a number of neuroscientists, particularly Elton and Goldberg, that new experience of every kind and in every modality is better entertained by the right hemisphere than the left. And the left takes over at the point when it seems to be something familiar. Also, it must not try to collapse that all important ambivalence that we were talking about into something familiar because that spoils the process it needs to be perfectly happy with not knowing for quite a period of time which again the right hemisphere is more able to sustain so in all these ways and the sudden perception of a new form a new pattern this is all very much better done by the right hemisphere so that that will make us predict certain things that most probably we will find that uh, if you experiment by enhancing right hemisphere activity or inhibiting left hemisphere activity, you may improve uh, creativity. We might see that in people who've had lesions in one or other hemisphere, whatever their um, form of creativity, lesions in the right hemisphere will be much more damaging than lesions in the left. And we would expect that being able to uh, observe and uh, perhaps image the brains of people engaged in truly creative exercises, um, we will expect the right hemisphere to be more important in its activity than the left. And all those are things that we could talk about now if you want to, but other things that I've said that set up questions you'd like to ask, Alex? Uh, yes, there's one. I don't know if that brings us apart or a bit aside of the path, but since you mentioned the unconscious mind, and there's in this mm. process of incubation. Um, well, it, I, I know it's not literally a place, but when this thing is being incubated, I wonder where is it being incubated and why it needs time to be incubated as if it was cooking. You know, I'm thinking of this metaphor of cooking. <laughs> and also what is meant that this is happening in the unconscious mind and, and, and why there? Um, the unconscious mm. mind, it's, it's mysterious to me. And, Again, not very popular, I would say, because it sounds like, well, it sounds like it's something going on under a carpet that, you know, very famous people postulated and probably it exists, but let's not give, in, let's not give it a lot of emphasis. Um, at least that's my naive view about what some people may think about the unconscious mind. So before moving to the lesions of, of yes, artists okay. and so on, if you could say something more about that, that would certainly help me. Yes. Well, I think what I would, I, I would largely agree with what you said, that the mainstream orthodox science is so dedicated to um, uh, making things explicit that um, it, it will find this um, a rather uncomfortable area, this, uh, any, anything to do with the unconscious. Well, we can work out what the machinery is and then we will finally have got hold of what it is. Uh, well, first of all, you can't go from brain machinery to what actually is going on. You can observe what's going on in the brain when you fall in love, but looking at the brain on a scanner is not going to help you understand the experience of being in love. Mm. So uh, there's that, but there's also the, the reality that um, unconscious uh, can mean several different things, and it's probably worth clarifying what they are. So what, of course, I'm not talking about is um, the kind of conscious or unconscious states um, that would occur if somebody were knocked unconscious. They were um, run over in the road, had a hand, head injury, and they were unconscious. That's, of course, not what we're talking about. Um, what we're talking about is a brain that is normally functioning but what we realize or need to realize and 
generally don't understand is that most of our mental activity is in fact unconscious. It's been estimated that it's about half of 1%. And you mentioned earlier that um, the importance of embodiment, we didn't pick that up. You said, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? That that seems to mean that it's got to be embodied. And that is exactly right, that the whole brain and the whole body are contributing to our understanding, to our getting information about the world, putting it together in forms that help us intelligently respond to the world. So cognition is not just an abstract process describable in a series of algorithms that's going on in a, a machine-like brain, but the whole business of intuition, imagination, emotion, bodily feedback, and so on is helping us in this process. But because when we reflect on our thinking, we obviously only see the bit we can see, which is the bit we've just been conscious of, we think that most of our thinking must be like that, but it's actually only half a percent. And that is the bit that is in that tiny spotlight of the left hemisphere. Mm -hmm. The attentional arc of the left hemisphere when it's focused is about three degrees out of the 360 degrees. So we are talking about a very uh, local, spotlight that's been turned on something and you know i use the image of a of the stage and a spotlight can come on a certain place in the stage and you see that and everything else on the stage disappears into darkness because of the bright light but it doesn't mean that the rest of the stage has gone away or a character that is now not illuminated doesn't exist <laughs> they're there okay. um, and so i think it's like that it's unfortunate that we have this image of like the unconscious being physically underneath the conscious. Uh, in no very obvious sense does that pertain. Uh, although one could say that the more ancient parts of the brain are definitely less conscious and that they do lie lower in the physical structure of the brain. That, that is true. But I think that's only incidental. Can one sort of make an, a, um, a, a useful connection between the right hemisphere and unconscious thinking? I think one can because both hemispheres are capable of unconscious thinking. But what is unusual in the left hemisphere is this bringing something into the hyper-focused business of our immediate attention. And that, that, that is what distinguishes the left hemisphere. It has this little bit that we think is everything, but is almost nothing. And the rest of the left hemisphere, and pretty much all of the right hemisphere, works best outside of the glare of the spotlight. Fascinating. You see, we have dark matter in physics and dark energy, yes. and here we have dark mind here. <laughs> I, I love that. Yes, that's very, very nice uh, thought. Yeah. And you're right that people are uncomfortable with it. And one of the things that's striking about Freud was that he really struggled to his whole intent was to drag what was in the unconscious mind out so that it was in the explicit glare of the conscious mind. Um, and he had, in my view, a very mechanistic vision, a sort of hydraulic vision of the mind, very much a mid 19th century, late 19th century vision of the mind. Whereas Jung, I think, saw something much more interesting, which is that there are archetypal symbols which are helping us make sense of the world. And they part of their richness is that they're not easily uh, collapsed into a concept. The, the whole point about an archetypal image or any kind of visual image, which he was much more reliant on than Freud was in understanding uh, cognition, is that it is part of the creative process and it can't be collapsed and made explicit so easily. If it does, it loses its power, like um, paraphrasing a poem or explaining a joke. So, um, yes, let's, let's talk a bit about um, what we might find. And, I thought it would be good to start with, um, well, we can start anywhere. Um, what's quite interesting, though, I think might capture people's attention, because people are always interested in, yes, well, okay, these things can happen in pathological states, that's fine. But I don't know much about pathological states. What I want to know is about the normal brain, you know. Mm. <laughs> and so we can come on to the pathological states because I think they're ab absolutely fascinating. But let's start by, um, can we actually suppress areas in one part of the brain? 
or stimulate areas in one part of the brain? And the answer is very definitely yes, using transcranial magnetic stimulation, which, of course, is um, achieved by moving a magnetic coil um, across uh, the skull of a subject uh, and by um, varying the frequency um, that's being used, you can either suppress or stimulate um, areas. And there are um, repeated experiments in which people have had uh, parts of the left, particularly left frontal cortex suppressed, and they become more creative. They, they, they're able to do things that in the normal state they're not able to do for a period during um, the suppression of the left hemisphere and for a short period afterwards. They may actually exhibit skills like being able to draw realistically in three dimensions that in the normal state they, they don't, they're not capable of doing. And one fascinating thing is the nine, uh, is it the nine dot problem? Or uh, Yes, I think that's it. Yes. Um, that, that most people, unless they've seen it before, cannot solve um, and not within any reasonable space of time. It would take them far longer than the test. But with the left hemisphere uh, suppressed or with the right hemisphere enhanced in the frontal region, 40% of the subjects were able to solve the nine dot problem, which is remarkable. So I just thought I'd throw those things out there, which show that actually when you get the left hemisphere out of the picture, it's more possible for the right hemisphere's creative potential to be realized. Uh, you know, uh, so that's, that, that's one thing to talk about. I mean, another would be studies on subjects who are creative, who are doing a, cre a truly creative task. Or maybe not even while they're doing it, but have learnt how to do it. So, for example, um, studies of dancers show that dancers who are of average um, skill, um, there is no particular hemispheric effect, a slight a tendency for the right hemisphere to be more involved, but not so striking. But really great dancers um, and highly skilled dancers, there's a very strong tendency for the right hemisphere to be more involved. Of course, there are many, many other studies, and I have a whole appendix in which I look at a lot of this information. But what it shows overall is quite clearly that if you choose a task that is truly creative, and if you look at subjects who have a track record of being truly creative, you will see a very clear effect of the right hemisphere being more important. I made those two caveats because sometimes studies of creativity are not really studies of creativity at all. Uh, we've touched on this before. They're really studies of a certain kind of problem solving where you move things about and you come to an answer. That is never going to give you uh, useful information on true creativity. And the other thing is this really fascinating evidence from a number of studies that people who are averagely creative may use either hemisphere equally or may actually use the left hemisphere more. But highly creative individuals have a strong tendency to be using the right hemisphere much more than the left. So there is one study in which the averagely creative use the left hemisphere more than the right, and in which the highly creative use the right hemisphere more than the left. Now, the failure to distinguish between average individuals and highly creative individuals, mm -hmm. and the failure to distinguish between truly creative tasks and minimally creative tasks has muddied the waters. But if you separate these things, you can see very, very clear pattern, I think undeniable pattern. Yes. And it's, cons it's gone, yeah. No, I was going to say, uh, as, as we were talking about intelligence in pre pre some previous sessions, like the distinctions between averages and distributions, and today you're making a distinction about the temporal phases, and also you're making a distinction about the typical tasks. That's very important to get a, a nuanced view of what we're talking about. It's not just like a, as, if it, as if it were a t-shirt that says right hemisphere forever. I'm just joking, <laughs> but, but I can sense it, it, and this is no joking, I can sense in this chapter particularly that there's a certain irritation from your side. Maybe it's because <laughs> creativity is, let's say, the topic. We've talked about perception, attention, memory, intelligence, which are not easy either, but it seems, it sounds as reading that there's some strong opponents of yours that have 
in a way irritated you perhaps because of this kind of broad stroke um the way to question or even dogmatically i may say perhaps deny the the importance of the right hemisphere and then then one needs to go into the details a little bit to talk about for instance what's meant by right hemisphere specializes in producing um, um these or that so, so maybe you could say something yes. about this resistance you've been you know wedging <laughs> and, and and how to reconcile the, the, the empirical data, which is empirical data, but at the same time, everybody has their own starting points, the, perhaps the, the, the claims that one wishes one could make. I mean, we're human beings doing science at the end of the day. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, it, it's, it's amusing that you pick up the slightly um, um, irritated tone. And there's two reasons for that. One is this, that I would love to have found that there was no special role for the right hemisphere in creativity. I suspected that there probably would be because everything I know about the right hemisphere suggests that it would be the one that would be more beneficial to creative acts. But the difficulty there is that this is one of the old cliches. You know, it was always said the right hemisphere is creative. And this is one case in which I'm afraid they were right. And, you know, I'd pay good money to have found actually what a relief. No, the right hemisphere doesn't play the key part. And then people would go, he's, he's good, you know, he's a good scientist and uh, all that. But uh, having really, really researched this in enormous detail and the evidence is in that chapter and in an appendix that relates to it, um, it's quite clear to me that the right hemisphere is far more important than the left. So that's one thing that causes me a little bit of grief. <laughs> and the other is that a number of people, you see, fascinating a number of people have been really quite dismissive of it and the degree to which they are dismissive is also a sign of something going on in their psyche which is emotional so they're actually when people become very dismissive you sometimes think they're aware that this may be true but they don't want to admit that for anything so they are just oh that's all complete rubbish and i've had to take cases where people have said this and look at their, their references and look at what it is they're talking about. And I do that in this book. Um, I devote one whole appendix actually to one particular study, um, which, which aimed to show this. And I show that by their own data, they don't show what they think they're showing, which is that there are no differences between the hemispheres yeah. in their role in creativity. So I think that's probably what you're picking up on. Um, in any case, my conclusion is, as with pretty much all the meta studies, the studies that look at large bodies of studies together, is that the right hemisphere is more mm. important than the left. And it's borne out in these fascinating cases of people, either people who weren't artists, but had a right hemisphere stroke, and of course, it, it had no impact on their creativity because they weren't creative or had a left hemisphere stroke and became creative for the first time. Yeah. And then on cases of established artists, composers and poets uh, by injuries to one or other hemisphere. Tell us something about that. Um, although it's N equal one, it's individual cases. Then we can go to the big bulk meta-analysis with lots of artists survey, but tell us a bit about the strokes, the lesion studies on, on artists, because they're very interesting. They, they are, and I, uh, when it comes to artists, one knows that there would be certain differences. For example, they're using um, a medium that is visuospatial. We know that when people have a right hemisphere stroke, the left half of space disappears because that's the part that the right hemisphere is responsible for so you'd expect those sort of things to impact on an artist but the whole range of phenomena that one sees is quite fascinating i i look probably at about i've never counted but i think it must be about 20 artists um about whom we know uh, something of their brain pathology and we can compare their pre-stroke uh, paintings and their post-stroke paintings or drawings. 
um, there's one very striking example that I show, uh, illustrate, I illustrate many of these in the book, and unfortunately that's not something we can do in a conversation, but uh, in that, um, in those illustrations, you see something going, uh, after a right hemisphere stroke, going from um, naturalistically rich, expressive, fluid, um, in motion, uh, to something static, caricature-like, and with bits missing after um, a right hemisphere stroke. And we also see other changes. Uh, I look at a couple of very well-known painters amongst the others. One is Otto Dix, and the other is Lovis Corinth. Um, and fortunately, we have a lot of evidence of how they work before and after a stroke. And what seems to happen is that, as I say, the sense of emotional connection to the world, the sense of a world that is expressive, of a face that is expressive, of something that is natural and three-dimensional, becomes two-dimensional, cartoon-like, and shows strange, um, sometimes bizarre uh, phenomena. And what I mentioned en passant is that people after a right hemisphere stroke develop phantom limbs. They have extra limbs <laughs> sometimes. And there are cases here um, in which um, that there was an extra finger in the hand, uh, which is extraordinary. Um, so you, if you look at the painting, it looks right. And when you come to study it, it, one of the hands has got six digits, not five. And also the hand comes into the picture in a very self-referential way, which reminds me of postmodernism. Part of the movement of postmodernism is exactly this move towards a left hemisphere world in which only caricatures, outlines, two-dimensional images, lacking in emotional expression, lacking in realism. That is the world that has brought into being by modernism, postmodernism. And, and that's, uh, I have a chapter on that in the Master and His Emissary on the modern world where I liken what the phenomena, which also follow, as Louis Sass pointed out, the phenomena of schizophrenia, that this is really due to um, an inability to understand and bring into play what the right hemisphere of the brain is able to tell us. So... <laughs> oh, wow, well, um, that's... Already there we have two big, two big things to maybe say something more about it because because are you saying that, that there's a superior and inferior art and um, also based on the hemispheres that are enabling it and also you just made a point about mental disease one could say which is also belongs to the end of this chapter so these are two in a way mm. i was just gonna say big claims they're not big claims but these are the two, mm. two important aspects are at stake, right? Because one is talking about superior and inferior art, and one is talking about, let's say, normal and pathological states of mind. Um, yes. Um, perhaps I should just say that my reason for mentioning um, this business of self-referentiality, modernism and the left hemisphere, was because in one of Otto Dix's self-portraits, before his stroke, he drew beautiful self-portraits. Afterwards, he drew these caricature-like uh, pictures. And what fascinates me is that in one of them, the hand that is drawing is drawn in the picture. And it gets between the viewer and the actual face that he's drawing. So this is really a... Um, a wonderful um, an analogue of the self-consciousness, the, the way in which in modernism the artist or the writer or whatever it is gets into the work between the viewer, the reader, and what he or she is creating. But you're right, I'm not really saying that there is inferior and superior, um, historically speaking, although I do think uh, in the case of these individuals with brain insults, one can say that after a right hemisphere stroke, their work lacks much of the richness mm. which made them famous before the stroke. Um, I'm not saying that in a culture, as it were, that there's something absolutely wrong with modernist art, uh, naturally. Um, and that's partly because a great artist, a gifted artist, will occur in any generation. 
And those artists will produce great art, even if the culture is not particularly congenial to that. And I see the great artists of modernism as having triumphed despite the, the worldview that, that was uh, common in this period. Whereas in many other uh, historical periods, they triumphed partly with the, with the current of the way the worldview of the age behind them actually um, making their task uh, easier. What to me is particularly striking with visual artists is that for the majority of them, if they've had a left hemisphere stroke, their right hand, which in, you know, in, in most cases will be their dominant hand for drawing, for painting, is no longer um, properly useful. So they will have to have achieved these post-stroke paintings and drawings using their non-dominant hand. And that to me is staggering because that already brings into the picture all kinds of problems with skill. You know, that, that's the hand that hasn't been used to drawing and painting, whereas your right hand, if you are a right-handed artist, has the embodied memory of all the paintings and drawings that you've been doing for decades. So it's all the more wonderful that after, or remarkable, I should say, that after a right hemisphere, um, sorry, a left hemisphere stroke, in which the right hand is not working, the artist may, within a very short period, be able to produce art at least as good or superior to um, the, 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 the paintings and the drawings that they used to do before the stroke. And you, 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 we, we can talk about other things too. We can talk about composers and poets, and I do in the book. And there again, there are, there are many examples of artists who had um, a left hemisphere stroke and afterwards their com compositions were said to be at least as great or greater than in many cases the work that they had before um, the left hemisphere stroke. Um, one of the couple of the best known ones are Stravinsky in Britain um, but there are many composers including the extraordinary case of uh, Alfred Schnittke uh, who had a series of catastrophic left hemisphere strokes and uh, ended up composing prolifically and far better than he did before the strokes. Uh, I mean, these sort of strokes were major strokes. I think he was twice declared clinically dead, and yet he came back from that degree of cerebral damage um, to be um, a, a great and pro prolific and productive mm -hmm. composer. So I can't deal with all the examples there, but there, there, there are many of them. And the, the composers have been studied um, by a Russian scholar and he tried to find instances where um, composers had had a um, right hemisphere stroke and what happened. And he only found two. Uh, and certainly in one about which we have information, uh, the German composer Engelbert Humperdinck, um, after the um, right hemisphere stroke, his works became uh, more trivial and the business became more difficult and he largely faded out as a composer. And I think the other case is also one in which the person wasn't anyway a great composer before the stroke, but after the stroke um, went on teaching music but ceased to compose. Then you come to poets and this one is very interesting because once again we're talking about what happens after a left hemisphere stroke. Now most people will associate language with the left hemisphere, so this is surely going to have a catastrophic effect on creativity, but in fact this is not the case. Um, th there are uh, numerous poets and some that people will know well would be uh, William Carlos Williams, uh, perhaps less well known outside his native country, but nonetheless a great poet, the Swedish Thomas Tranströmer, who won a Nobel Prize for his poetry, something like a decade after he'd had um, a right hemisphere, sorry, a left hemisphere stroke. Um, so there are many instances. And what I think I would draw attention to there is that, yes, the left hemisphere is, has a richer vocabulary than the right, and it has 
a more subtle uh, grasp of syntax than the right, but the right hemisphere does have a lexicon and it does understand syntax. And if the left hemisphere is disabled, it can take over these functions rather well. But it also subserves things that are crucial to poetry, the understanding of metaphor, the understanding of what is not said, the understanding of what is implied through an image, through, you know, all of that. And so we find that that is preserved and that the the nature of the poetry may change somewhat. Uh, Trans Chalmers' work was always telegrammatic. After his stroke, it became more telegrammatic, more like sort of Japanese haikus and so on. But his, his great works were considered to come after his uh, left hemisphere stroke. So really what I think in, in a nutshell, um, I've been able to demonstrate and I, I can't mention all the cases or even some of the famous cases in this uh, overview, but in all these cases, um, in all those art forms, uh, one gets the general picture that after a right hemisphere stroke, um, creativity deteriorates or ceases. After a left hemisphere stroke, it very often continues unimpaired or actually better than it was. So that's the take home message there. Let me add here this um, kind of announcement or invitation again, because we're doing these conversations to talk about your new book. It's not that it's a kind of mm. mar a marketing strategy. I mean, I do it because I enjoy it <laughs> terribly and I, yes. and I love it and I learned so many things. So it's, it's a pleasure. But just to remind the listener that he or she can become a reader. And, and so there, that's much more evidence in the book, many more cases. Mm. Also, the figures mm. is something we've talked about mm. offline, and figures mm. drawing sketches are very, very telling. And for instance, in this very mm. chapter, figures twenty and twenty-one, I think, are. I mean, we yes. cannot. We decided we we're not gonna project them in our conversation because that would kind of break a bit the flow. But I would say we invite the listeners to become readers and, and look at those figures. So there are the evidence, mm. the figures, the references, and the notes, which are super, super rich. And in this case, this, for this chapter, it's the first appendix appears, and there are a total of eight appendices, I think. So it, yeah. it's a, just to, it's like a little break, but it sounds like a commercial break, but <laughs> there's a, a lot of uh, information in, in all these different variants, references, appendices, figures, that, that we cannot possibly do justice at all just by having a conversation. No, no, that's 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 uh, absolutely right, and and actually there are also a wealth of colour plates, so not only of um, better known painters like Bosch and Dali, but um, I think there are eight plates of paintings by Lovis Corinth, who I mentioned earlier, uh, four from the period before his stroke and four from the period after, because one of the things there is the richness of the texture of the painting, of the colours of the painting, um, the sense of connection, which you can only really see to full advantage when it's represented in colour. So, yes, I mean, all that I'm saying will be rather abstract in the purely verbal realm, but is there, as you say, enriched by a lot of reference, um, both to the science and to the art. And you yeah. have a sensitivity and love for it, given the painting you have behind, which has to do, which is the painting you use, isn't it, for the for the covers of the book? So it's, it's, the, it's the painting I use for the cover of the of volume two. Yeah. It's a painting by Ross Loveday, um, a, a British, I think, Welsh artist. Um, and I have, I, I'm lucky enough to own two of his paintings. And the other one, uh, which has more gray and brown and bronze tinges in it, I use for the cover of um, volume one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose we ought, uh, before we finish, to talk a bit about mental illness and creativity. And, and this is another area where people fight shy of it because, um, once again, they don't want to be seen to be falling into the trap of um, embracing a, a popular myth. And that there is a popular myth uh, that creativity and mental illness may have a connection. Mm. Um, and it's a myth because it's largely true. <laughs> I mean, myths are ways of actually understanding reality. They may reveal something. So I'm not using the word myth in a dismissive sense, rather the opposite. 
Uh, and again, I suppose one would have to summarize because I look at a lot of studies, both of contemporary um, creative artists and writers uh, who are studied in their lifetime in workshops. And then uh, that information was correlated with their psych psychiatric history. Uh, what one finds in that uh, overview and in many other studies of whole populations, um, more commonly in Scandinavia, where uh, the, 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 there's enormously um, richly gathered data on the, the population, for example, through, trans, uh, through the process of conscription to the army in Finland, I think in Sweden, uh, may be wrong about that, but there are enormous databases where um, people as they're recruited are psychologically tested. So we have a huge amount of information to go on. Um, what, what one sees there is that there is, uh, there's no question about it, a correlation between creative um, function and manic depression or bipolar disorder as it's called now and simply depression. So those two, which are in some ways um, a continuum, seem to be very strongly overrepresented, and so does suicide. I, I talk about the enormously much higher rates of suicide amongst poets, for example, um, than uh, amongst literary scholars. It, it, it's really quite low and in line with the national average for literary scholars and critics, but for actual poets and creative writers, it's very, very much higher. There's also something to say about schizophrenia. In general, schizophrenia is, is difficult because it depends how severe the form of schizophrenia was, and it depends on the nature of the kind of creativity undertaken. So people who are on the schizo-autistic spectrum, maybe schizotypal, as psychiatrists say, they may have some of the features of schizophrenia without being mentally ill. So they don't have frank delusions, hallucinations, and so on, but they have some of the mental habits of those who are schizophrenic and may have some of the, the genes responsible for schizophrenia. We think that probably a certain number of genes need to come together, probably about as many as 11 or more genes that would underlie the development of schizophrenia. And environmental effects can either guard against it to some extent or precipitate it to some extent, but there undoubtedly is a genetic basis for that disease. Um, and so those people who are not actually um, mentally ill in the formal sense, may have ways of thinking that are unorthodox and lead them to make rather interesting um, creative um, findings. And so I tend to, when, that, when studies come up with uh, schizotypal patients activate the right hemisphere much more than others do for this kind of a task, I have deliberately not included that, even though it's in favor of my belief that the right hemisphere is more responsible because in schizotypy, the brain is probably completely abnormally lateralized and we don't really know what it is we're looking at. So I, I don't, I rely only on good studies that show good cases where quite clearly the right hemisphere is more, um, more, more uh, important in, in the creative process. So there, yes, I mean, what do you think about all that? I mean, it's an idea that's been, you know, around for a long time. Uh, Aristotle said, you know, why is it that great philosophers and poets uh, seem always to be melancholic in their temperament? Well, we talked at the very beginning about um, optimism, right, and pessimism and hopeful pessimism and, and mm. the different understandings of the world. And that the, didn't we, that the left hemisphere, if we can say it this way, is more in a way assertive and, and sure of, of itself and positive and promising and everything's gonna go work great. Now the, the right one would tend to do the opposite. And again, it sounds bad news because it's like, well, where, don't we want to be kind of happy and, and, and cheered up? Now with respect to melancholy, I, I, could one be melancholic and still 
find some joy you know that's a strange question but like even the the the, the word grief which is not necessarily mm. sadness or sorrow i mean to me grief has a and i'm drawing here from stephen jenkinson who's a, a really mm. remarkable author and, and, and thinker and he talks a lot about grief in the context of death and mm. and Mm. I mean, he's a master of unpacking these words, so I'm at least going around them. And so, although it sounds negative or, uh, you know, obscure, grief um, has to do, in his view, I think, well, at least in my view, with being more in contact with life. And so, mm -hmm. let's not judge it as being like thumbs up or thumbs down, is it cheered up? It's like mm -hmm. an emoji. It's not like about, about an emoji, like is it smiling or is it not? I mean, there seems to be mm -hmm. something about being in, in direct contact with reality mm -hmm. that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily need to be kind of a happy thing. Nevertheless, one of my <laughs> hero philosophers, as I think I've told you, is Henry Bergson, and he speaks a lot about joy. And he in some way mm -hmm. writes that the mark of a true that the, the, the mark of actually creative of, of, of being in this flow of creativity is, is um, this joy, right? So, well, there's a tension that I haven't resolved, but well, let's I would hold these apparent opposites there. Probably, probably, or for sure, all you're saying is sustained and by the data. At the same time, um, I think there's a joyful aspect of, of even this grief or melancholy that we should not take for granted. Uh, yeah, quite clearly. I mean, the first thing to say is that we know from all the chapters that the reader will have read up to this point, that the right hemisphere is a much better guide to reality, is more in touch with reality than the left. I mean, that's very, very clear. And it's also true that people who are depressed to some degree, at any rate, um, are more realistic and are better judges of reality than people who are in the normal, uh, somewhat uh, uh, shielded um, realm where the full business of reality doesn't impinge, the place mm -hmm. where we, we normally live. As T.S. Eliot said, humankind cannot bear too much reality. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the, the answer to what you're discussing depends on temporal phases again. So for example, we know that when poets are very depressed, they don't create. But their periods of creativity come after a period of depression. So they're in the recovery phase or fully recovered from an episode of depression. And it's then possibly a year, nine months, a year, 18 months after the period of depression that their full creativity flourishes. That time course has been studied, and I quote that evidence in the book. Um, equally, when people are manic, um, they're not usually very creative when they are in the manic state. They think they are. They may cover whole walls with streaks of paint, um, but actually their work is not very good. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's simply got no integrity. It's got no discipline. And there's a rather nice New Yorker cartoon um, I, I, I remember in which um, there's, a, there's a man holding a palette and looking, standing back from a, a, a painting with lots and lots of streaks across it like this. And his, his partner is standing there next to him and going, more lithium. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> lithium being, of course, uh, the treatment for, for mania. So um, that's one of the things that I think would be worth mentioning is that it, it's not that when one's in the mentally ill state that one does one's best creative work. And for that reason, uh, painters uh, and artists have been asked whether they think they're more creative when they're on lithium or not. And what they say is a quarter of them say they're less creative on lithium, a quarter say there's no difference, but a half say that they're more creative when they're on lithium. Mm. Because um, they, when they're on lithium, although it takes away those peaks in which they think they're being creative, it enables them to remain in the state in which they actually are more creative for longer. Mm. So yes, that's, that's, uh, that's an important point to make. And I think there are some things to say about the hemispheres here. After all, uh, I may have hinted before, and if I haven't, I will, I will say it anyway, um, <laughs> whether I have or not, that the right hemisphere is probably preponderant in 
uh, certainly in large cases of depression, the right frontal lobe is, if you like, unopposed to a greater degree than it should be. It should be balanced by the left frontal lobe, and it should be balanced by its own right hemisphere posterior cortex. And in different kinds of depression, either there is a failure of the right hemisphere posterior cortex or of the left hemisphere frontal cortex to some extent. It's not, I'm not saying that in every case that you scan this will be the case, but there's a consistently significant body of data mm -hmm. suggesting that this is the case. Now, when the right frontal lobe is working to full extent, it causes an increase in empathy, an increase in guilt, in other words, a sense of responsibility, an increase in the capacity to understand the implicit, to understand metaphor, to understand and interpret all the array of things that are not um, expressed in direct language. And so these are exactly the things that you would imagine would be good for a poet. Mm. Um, not necessarily the guilt, but w what you find when people are uh, um, in that depressive state is that they do exhibit a sense of empathy. They're overwhelmed by the suffering of humanity. They're overwhelmed by the sense that they have played some part in this, quite often quite irrationally in coming about. You know, like a patient I had who thought he'd caused the war in Bosnia, but, you know, had never, never left the country. <laughs> um, so there's a way in which a propensity to develop depression and a defense, a, a propensity to be good at writing poetry may go hand in hand because they're, um, they're both states of mind that involve a relatively um, unopposed right frontal cortex. But because in the middle of that illness, one is not really properly creative at all. That process comes into its own later, which is what I was saying. And interestingly, it's also true of comedians, because that, that is the same area that, it, that enables us to understand humour. After all, humour is about making distant connections and about what is not said. It's about the implicit suddenly coming into relief and making us laugh. So th th that process suggests again the ability to use the right frontal lobe uh, to good effect and there are even more astonishing parallels between a history of depression and being a comedian as there are between a history of depression and being a poet yeah thanks for mentioning the comedians i just want to add with and with what and and with one comment which may seem rather obvious but maybe we need to make it because you were using very carefully the word pro propensity, right? And you're not talking here about kind of obligatory causality at all. We're not saying, well, if you want to be creative, you better be mentally ill. I mean, that, that's stupid, right? You're talking about significant relationships. We could say strong correlations, but does, that doesn't mean like there's a, a, an arrow forcing in one way or another. And just because sometimes we, we get kind of summary ideas of what we're yeah. talking about. And, it, one need to go to the details. When 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 one zooms out, I hope the idea of the listener is not I see. So you need to be um, <laughs> have this stroke or be mentally ill um, <laughs> creative because that but that can contribute to the resistance to the myth because it sounds like a formula that's applied regardless of all these nuances that you're conveying in the book. So I think well I mean, maybe that's I mean mm. an obvious thing to say. But sometimes can be if one is quick in thinking, can be, you know, yeah. can fall into these pitfalls I, of simplicity. Absolutely, and thanks for making that point. It's so important. Um, the difficulty with a brief presentation like this is that there is no time to go into the subtleties. One is giving a headline answer, which is always more black and white than and more extreme sounding than the reality that it's referred to. Um, and I certainly don't think that we'd all be better off if we had a left hemisphere stroke, uh, certainly not. And we do actually need to be fully functioning individuals and at certain stages in the creative process, the left hemisphere comes back into play. What it needs not to do is get involved during the process of incubation and illumination. It can be there in the laying down of the preparation and it can be there in the kind of critical phase when you're looking at what you've written and you improve it. I call it quality control because that's 
another task of the left hemisphere to be the critic but usually the critic is not a good creator and the creator may not be a good critic so they do have different roles there and a point that's often made as though it were a deadly blow to the idea of there being a relationship between mental illness and creativity is uh, there are lots of people who are mentally ill and not at all creative and there are lots of people who are creative who are not at all mentally ill absolutely correct but that doesn't in itself detract from the fact that there is an enormous statistically very highly significant correlation between the two when one has a correlation between two things one doesn't mean that it always applies in every case that would be extraordinary as i say i give the analogy of suppose i'm asked to investigate all the murders in britain that happened in the last year and there are 500 um, and I would expect they, them to be generally distributed over the country with no particular focus, really. Uh, and what I find is suddenly there's a small village in Wales where there have been 45 murders. Well, OK, that's significant because on statistical expectation, there would have been none or at the very most one. So the fact that there's 45 going on there is very, very important. But it's no argument against it to say, Oh, well, in the f other 455 cases, they didn't take place in this village. So, I mean, I'm just trying to make it vivid for the listener yes. that what we're talking about here are very important, but never universal correlations. Again, not procedural, right? They're not um, algorithms to then be forced and play mindlessly. No, <laughs> absolutely not. You, there's no royal road to creativity. You have to be patient and you have to wait and it may not come at all but mm. trying to force it will certainly not bring it mm. i'll probably have some more to say about that when we come to talk about imagination in chapter 19 i think it is but uh, we're, we're only on chapter closer. eight at the moment we're getting closer <laughs> yeah so next, we're getting chapter, closer. next chapter is the last yeah, yeah. chapter of part one so we're yes yeah. we're moving yeah. forth <laughs> We are, we are, we are. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, as always. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much, Alex. Uh, we'll be back again very soon. See you soon. Goodbye. See you soon. Bye.